Hi, welcome to Learn and Flutter, and this is part two of our mini series on block pattern. Now, first of all, on the outset of this video, I have to apologize for the video being late. Um, I got sick and then I couldn't record the video. And then there's some construction also that you might hear in the background. There's some noise. So um, that's going to go on for a few days. And I didn't want to all laugh anymore until that finished. Um, neighbors doing some construction and so on. And additionally, I want to say thanks to the viewer who corrected me on the previous video. I said um, block pattern means um, business logic object controller. And that is wrong. It's business logic component. Um, thanks again, and um, let's get into it. So in this video, I want to cover futures. So in part one, we look at streams, and we use them in a very limited way. That's not very flexible. Uh, we were able to create a stream and subscribe to it for events, and we got events from, let's say, a list. We took a list and converted to a stream. In this video, I want to look at futures. And I promise you, by the end of this video, I'll tie it back to streams. And then this is going to give us a fairly good idea of how Dart handle events. And we will be better able to implement our block pattern. I hopefully understand it fundamentally in such a way that we won't be confused by it. Let's get started. So here I am at my terminal and I'm looking at my directory and this is part two. So I'll start my Visual Studio Code editor for part two. So I have here this readme.md, which I will go over later, but um, I have my main.dart and you can see it doesn't really have anything. So here's the scenario. For us to really get into futures, um, I figured out how I come up with something contrived, but hopefully it illustrates the idea. So imagine that I have a task to perform and I'm going to enjoy the rewards after I perform this task. So let's simulate that with some functions. Uh, I just got a task and reward. And so I can write that as, and then my reward, again, very simple function. I remember no matter how fast I type, you have all this code available. You can literally, as you watch this video, click on this link and go see all the code. So hopefully there's no mystery about this code. And I think you know what would happen if I were to run this. Very straightforward, no mystery here. So we see doing task one, enjoying reward. But sometimes your tasks take a long time. So um, to simulate something that's taken a long time, I'll put a for loop that doesn't do anything. And so basically I have a for loop that's going to loop long enough on my system at least to waste some time. So let's run that again. And we should see that I'm doing task. Okay, maybe I need to increase that a little bit. Um, so let's see how long it takes now. And yep, look like I'm doing some work, spend some time doing that. And then I should expect to see um, enjoying rewards. Okay, great. So we don't know how, many, how much time that is. So let's put some print out the time before I start doing my task. And for this, I'll use the date time object and get the current time. All right. So at least I have the time when I start doing work, and I have the time when I start enjoying my reward. So actually, I can move those into my functions so that I know when I start doing the task and when I start doing enjoying my rewards. All right. Uh, we can run that just to be sure that we haven't broken anything. And so we see the time at which I start doing my task. And then shortly we'll see when I start doing, enjoy my reward. All right, great. It looked like um, my task took me about five seconds. That's okay. It doesn't really matter what it is on your system. Just try and tweak the numbers a little bit. Maybe you might have to cut this in half or you might have to add one here. Whatever makes sense for your system. So just sort of see a little few seconds delay. Now I'm using a for loop that actually doesn't do anything but burn CPU cycles instead of anything fancy like sleeping. Because we like procrastinating in life, and we like putting things off, and maybe we even want to enjoy our rewards before we actually put in the hard work, 
The thing that we want to be able to do now is we still have this work that we're supposed to do before we enjoy the rewards, but we want to put it off a little bit. So one of the things we can do is put it off for the future because that's what procrastinating is. It's really putting something off for the future, right? You're going to do it later. That's putting it off for the future. So Dart has some a class called Future that allow us to put things off for later to be done in the future. So why don't we use that to put off our tasks so we can start enjoying our rewards earlier? And it's very, very easy to use. And I'll give you some resources that help me understand the execution cycle in Dart and these things like futures and sync and async, which we are gonna cover, and streams. And those resources are in this readme, which I'll cover later. But just trust me on this when I say that a future is just a class that allows you that schedule something to be run later and it'll make sense in a few how it works so let's create a future and so maybe before i do it that way uh, maybe i should just come here and then put future here and so if we an object representing a delayed computation that's exactly what we want to do we want to delay running or doing our work and if you look at the constructor for a future, at least one of it, is that you can pass a function that doesn't take anything and it simply returns a future object, okay? And so for us, we will simply pass our task to be done. So let's do that. And task one is what we will pass in. Now remember, we're not executing the function. We're saying, run this function for me later. And now we can get rid of this and let's rerun our code and see what happens. So we run our code again and what do we see well we see the time that we start enjoying reward remember we always print out the time when we're going to start enjoying a reward and then we're doing our task much later so this is when we're able to enjoy our reward notice the time and then after we enjoy our reward only then we're able to start doing our task which is exactly what we want we want to reverse things and mix it up a little bit now you're probably a little bit confused as to what is going on here. And so let me show you how Dart actually execute things and then maybe this will make sense. Here's what's happening in Dart. It is using queues to schedule or determine what gets done when. And to understand what a queue is, now I understand most of us probably know what queues are, but just for the benefit of making sure that everyone is on the same page, I'll assume that uh, we don't know, and so I'll cover Q. And the Q we're talking about here specifically is a first-in, first-out Q called a FIFO. So if you imagine a Q sort of like a pipe, and then you imagine that uh, you can sort of insert things on one end of that cube, then we can imagine that uh, these are the events going into that cube, being enqueued into the queue then what is going to happen is eventually events will be removed from the queue and worked on. One at a time, each event will be taken out of the queue and worked on. And that's why it's first in, first out, because notice the first thing that went in was the first thing that came out. There's also first in, last out, but that's just FYI. And so again, F5 just simply mean first in, first out. Okay, so now let's look at how Dart actually execute your code then using this idea of Q. So let's look at the execution flow of a Dart application. So what happened is when you launch a Dart application, it starts up. So it's in the startup state. You can imagine this is before it invoke your main. This is when it's process all the environmental variable, command line parameters, all those other things, setting up the environment to run your application. So then it starts ex executing your main function. This is the entry point to your, your program. Now, main is gonna call other functions and do all the other things, and we're gonna ignore all of that because it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, everything that main calls and everything is going to run and complete, and then your main function exit. At this point, what you normally see is that your application exits. But that is not what's really happening behind the scene. What's happening behind the scene is Dart actually, on the completion of main, goes and check a queue. Now, remember, we just talked about a queue and how it's a FIFO queue. And so it goes and checks this queue and it says, hey, this queue that I'm going to check is called the micro task queue. And are there any tasks in this queue? Basically, is this queue empty? 
And if the answer is no, this queue is not empty, then it needs to execute a task or run that task that's in the queue. As it takes one, FIFO queue, remember, it takes the first one that was put in there and it runs it. After it finished running that task, it goes back. Notice where it goes back to. It goes back to checking the queue. Your main has exited. It cannot be rerun. You can only enter main once, but it's going back to this queue and checking to see if there's still stuff there to be done. And so long as there's, there are things in that micro task queue, it takes it, runs it, and go back and check. Eventually, what will happen is your it's going to check and the micro task queue is going to be empty. And now it goes and check another queue. So once it's finished with the micro task queue, it goes and check this thing called the event queue. And it says, are there any events in the event queue? And if the answer is the event queue is not empty, there are events there, it handles that event. It takes an event and say, oh, let me invoke a handler for it. After it finishes, here's the important thing. This is interesting. So pay attention to this. After it finished handling an event from the event queue, where does it go next? It goes back to check if they are micro tasks. So it's possible that when you are handling an event, a micro task was added to the micro task queue. And as a result, it needs to execute those micro tasks before event queues. So you can think of these two queues as priority queues where the micro task queue has a higher priority than the event queue. And therefore, even if it executes something from the event queue, it's only when the micro task queue is empty. But since once it finished executing a event from the event queue, it goes back and say, let me check this I priority micro task queue again before going back to process another event. All right, so keep that in mind. So now it's processing messages from these two queues with the micro task queue being the higher priority queue. When there's no more work to be done in either queue, it says that, oh, there's nothing left in the event queue, so therefore I can exit. And if you, that's when your application can exit. So previously, what you were seeing is after main, because you didn't put anything in the, any one of the queues, your application was being exited. What we have just done by using future was able to put something in one of these queues. And to see which one of the queues, we will go back to some code and get an idea. Let's return to the code now. So we're back in our code and we see that how we can postpone the work we're doing for later. So we can add many things to this queue as we saw. And so this explains why we were able to enjoy our reward, which was basically run this function, call this function the reward function, our main exited, and because we had enqueued something on the queue, on one of those queues, and it so happened that what we put it on was the event queue, by the way, so no more mystery here and suspense, we put something on the event queue, and that was able to run after our main exited. So we can create another task. Let's say we're doing, have yet another task to perform. Let's call this task two. Oh, come on, task two. And so we can put that on the event queue also to be run. Now, it doesn't sort of matter when we call this. We could call it, well, of course, task two is going to run after task one once you put it, we use in futures. But what I mean is that we can call this after our rewards or before our rewards. It doesn't matter. These two things are being put in the event queue. So they're not going to run until after main exit anyway. So let's put a message here to say i am done so we know how we have ended our main function and we can see that all these tasks are getting run after main exit let's clean up and rerun our code so let me give us a little bit of room here and so we should be able to see that we enjoy and reward this is the end of main and like we said now we can run task one and then we can do task two so those are the things that are running in that event queue so how then, notice our program just ended because once we said doing task two, we actually spent some time doing task two. We didn't put anything at the end of it. So that's why we don't, you know, we didn't put a message at the end of um, when we completed doing our task. We only put that we started in the task. That's fine. After putting something on the event queue, now let's put something on the micro task queue. So I'm using an anonymous function. All right, so I have enqueued something by using 
future that micro task and I've given it some computation an anonymous function to call. Now I could have created a function and then used that just like I was doing with the future earth, but it doesn't really matter. It's just an anonymous function. And I've put that, placed that on the micro task queue. And we should, what should we expect? Remember what we said? It doesn't matter the order in which we run these. These things don't actually get run. They actually get in queued for later. And so these two get in queue on the event queue and th this get in queue on the micro task queue. But based on the flow chart that we saw, what's going to happen? They're going to get in queue, not run. We're going to run or enjoy our reward. We're going to print out that this is the end of main. And after main exit, now is going to go and check the micro task queue. And it's going to see that how there's work to be done. And it's going to do this first, even though we call these other guys. And that is because the micro task queue has a higher priority than the event queue. So that's our expectation. Let's run the code and see if that's what we get. And so there we go. This is the end of main. And look at this. We're doing something really quick on the micro task queue. Then we're doing work on our event queue and then our program is going to end. So this is how we put something on the micro task queue. Now we can put something on the micro task queue from within a event queue. So in, when we run our program here, for example, let's say task one, task one could have put something on the micro task queue and because we're going to recheck the micro task queue before we do anything else on the event queue, guess what? That thing would get run before task two. Now we can keep playing with this and this video is going to be very long as it is. It's going to be fairly long. So I encourage you to read the reference material that I'm going to give you. I'm going to go over it. I'm going to show you the ones that I found that were most illustrative and made me understand this material. And so that is what I'm going to give you. But I sort of still want to go over some of it. Now we have some idea of how we can put things in the two different queues. But if this was all there is to it, then this by itself would have been really nice. But since we're running something in the future, wouldn't it be nice to be able to know when we actually got to run this work? We, we, we don't know when we actually did all of this, right? Just like how when we had streams, we were able to say, register a listener for when things come out to the stream. We can do something with the future. So a future, you can think of it as, as we've seen, something that you can put out for later, but you can also register for a notification when this work actually completes. That's the key, when this work completes. So since this is an object, I can save it into a variable. So let's do that. So var f is equals to my future here that I'm creating for task one. Let's call it f1, if you will. And then we will say f1 that then, and notice there's this then function, and it says register callback to be called when this future completes. This, what we pass in here is going to be called when the future completes, when the, our task is done, not before our task is complete. So we'll do that, and what the then callback gives you is a value that you can operate on, which you can return from your task. So right now, our task is not returning any value, it's null. So we can still um, accept that value, but it wouldn't be anything. Um, it's null essentially, but we can say, and so we just put in an anonymous callback right now. And so we can say print. Okay, my task was completed. Now, of course, we don't know which task it is, and I'm mixing my quotes here. I went to double quotes this time, but oh well. So Let's put some space in to sort of see what we're doing and keep it nice and clear. And so let's run this now and see what we get. Let's run the code. And there we go. We're waiting for task one to complete. Task one completed and we have my task was completed. And that happened before we were able to even start task two. So this gets called or code here gets called when this future completes and it runs to completion. Whatever the code is, it runs to completion. Now, this is not the recommended way to do it. Yes, future, we get a value back and we can do then on it, but it's best that we actually attach 
to the return value because what can happen is someone could come and insert some stuff in between here and dart does allow for when you try to register a then function that if the future have already completed that it runs that on a micro task and it's all in the documentation but it's not the recommended way of doing things now let me show you something else that you can do you can register more than one then function so like i said the best way to do this is like this where you attach the then to the future value as soon as you get that future value and that way well not the future value but the future object and that way there's no sort of race condition or anything weird that can possibly happen and so it's explicit here that oh, this should execute on the completion of this. Not that it wasn't clear the other way, but they recommend that you do it, do it this way. And so one of the other things you can do is actually attach multiple then function. So we can say something like this. So we can say, and then, and then, and then, right? And so if we do this, we can say, my task was completed, note one, for example. And then my task was completed, let's say like note two, for example. And of course, it's going to be the same thing. We'll just see two messages because it's going to run each one of these then function on the completion of this, but in the order that they appear here. So let's just see that. Now I'm working up to something. And so there we go. Uh, we're not finished yet. So doing task one. And then there we go. Right. And those two things were registered. So you could register as many as you like on this thing. Now, what about this value? We said it all our then function can take a value. Where does this value come from? Well, it comes from our task that's going to be running on that in that future. And so we can return a value here that says something like this completed task one, for example. But now we're getting an error message because our task here is marked as not returning a value. So what is the values returning? A string. So that's fine. And then here we can do the same thing. Of course, we can return a value here. Task two, for example. And we can say that we're returning a string. So these are just ordinary functions. We didn't have to do anything special to these functions to make them um, be usable in futures, okay? And so now that our functions here are returning a value, now we can see that what we can, our return function takes nothing but expects a string as the parameter for the computation, right? It returns a string and it expects a string in this value. So, and it tells us here, now we're doing a string because Dart could infer that from the fact that we're running task one, which returns a string. If we change this to int, it will set our in value here is a, this on value is a int or whatever we change it to. So now we can say my task was completed. And so if I do something like that, what I'm saying is print out when this thing is task is completed, print out I blah, 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 note one, I blah, 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 note two. And so let's clean up. I hope you're following so far. Sorry if that seemed like a whole lot of code, but I tried to develop this very slowly. And so we're running task one and yep, we said I completed task one. Notice the I completed is on our then and this completed task one came from our task that we ran later. For task two, for note two, well, we did not have a value. So what is happening there? Well, what is really happening is what we have done is chain the when we put the to then function we're saying that this should be run on the completion of this future and then if this future returns another value then i want to do a then on that future and so far there was another future value that was returned it was just null how do i know there was another future value that was returned let's do this let's return a value from this then function so we return that out huh Still a bit more to do. Okay. For example, let's do something like that. And so I'm returning a value from my 10 function. And by return a value, Dart is smart enough to 
look at it and wrap it into a future. And if it's not a future, you can return an explicit future that gets computed. And what that means is that is also going to put, be put on the event queue. And when that's finished executing, then this then function is called for it. So Dart is smart enough to do all this. And it's so much information, like I said, we can't really cover all of it in this one video. But let me show you what it looks like now that we've returned a value from our then function. So doing task one, spend wasting some time. We should see our then function run to set task one. And then we said a still bit a bit more work and we return that value from our den function, which was then passed to the den function here. Now, if we return a future, we're actually gonna say that we want it to be done later. So we can we can enqueue something else onto the task queue, right? So something like this. And we could enqueue something to be run later. And then have that thing return a value. And at this point, it's just could get really, really crazy. But uh, hopefully um, all this stuff um, sort of makes sense and basically by returning a future since it's a future we create in a next event to be put in the event queue so when we've completed this first one and we print out this note what we're doing is in queue and there's still more work to be done for task one to be run later so we should expect this to come out after task two because it's going to be in queued when we run this then function and task two was already in queue. Does that make sense? See, before we didn't actually create a future, we just simply return a value and we we're able to chain it. So each one of those then function run one after the other, right? That still doesn't change that each then function run after one after the other. It's just that now since we're returning in not a future as our value, this then function then have to wait until this future completes. Whereas before, since we were just returning a value, it could have just run because it wasn't a future. Um, hopefully you saw that before from the result and now you'll see the, the change that I'm talking about, the fact that we were able to enqueue something else. And so doing a quick thing, doing task one, we're gonna see see task one node notice how we do task two and then we're going to do this because this is yet another future so this gets in queue after task two just think about those queues that i showed you and hopefully you see it every time you use future you add something to the event queue and so because of the order in which we have to go pick up things from the event queue well this sort of tells you that how this had to be executed after task two I want to caution you about something. In Dart, there's a way to do something like this. You can put two dots here. And I save this. And what this says is, remember, this creates an object. And on that object, I'm calling this den function. What this means is attach a den function to this very same object, not on a, the future that was returned, but rather on this very same one. So in Dart, this is a short end for if you have, let's say, a person, you can do person, that name, that age. And so this is short end really. So let me put it this way. Notice that it's on the same object that I'm setting name and I'm setting age. That is the key. So when we do it like this, we're calling then two times on the same future. So we're saying when this future co completes, I want these two actions to be accomplished. Whereas when we put the single dot, what we're saying is when this future completes, I want this action to be performed. And then the value that's returned from this, I want that to be passed to the next um, action. So it's almost like if there was a future return here and then but if there was actually a future value, then wait for it. But if there's no future value, then they're just executed. That is why when we saw when we simply return a string, this then function was able to execute immediately because we did not have a future. Okay, so I just wanted to point out those two things, the difference between the single dot and the double dot. Um, I don't know how better to say that, but hopefully by just demonstrating the two pieces of the code earlier, it makes sense. Okay, so that's just something in Dart that um, you can do but just want you to be careful of it. This is called the um, asynchronous API from the you know, Dart async library. And 
you do not have to explicitly import that library anymore in Dart 2. So before you would have to do import Dart async. And we did that for some of the stream stuff, but for future stuff, you don't need, as you can see, we were able to use it without importing the library. So let's call this exercise one. So now let's look at exercise two. Here's the other way that we can do this. Now notice how we're explicitly creating futures here and then listening to them. We can instead say that though, when we call our task, it returns a future that tells us, hey, I am going to let you know when this complete. So we can say that our function returns a future string value. So let's do this again. We're going to say that we're returning a future value that's parameterized on a string. So how are we going to do this? Well, let's create a future. Let's create a future and let's return that future. So what is the work then that we must do? Well, the work we must do, we're going to do it in this anonymous function. And this is the work that we're going to do. And we're going to return a value. So that's essentially what we're doing. So now our tasks are creating the futures themselves. Well, if the tasks are creating the futures themselves, then we don't really need to create the future out here. We simply need to call our task and since they return a future then we can listen in on that value and we'll simplify it we're not going to create a second future but we'll simply say that um, we're done print out the value and done you understand how this work with if a future returns a future how that's dealt with so we'll just leave it at that okay so there we go all right so what did i miss so this guy is then open this print on value close parentheses there and semicolon and I think oh I don't need this okay there we go and then for the second task same thing we're going to we weren't listening on it, the result but we can do then once that is returned now we can print and value. Okay, so now we've listened to task two and we're waiting for it to complete. But notice how we've cleaned up our main. So this is a little bit more readable. And so if we run this, we should again see the same result, which is we're able to enjoy a reward we're able to print out this as the end of main. And then of course, there is our task one and task two, and we're able to handle it. So this doesn't look give us any different result, except I think the code is a lot cleaner this way to understand. And notice that we did what we said was, instead of saving that value and then calling then, we immediately call the then callback on that future value. So far, we're still using the futures um, API to do all of this. Dart 2 also allows us to use something called async and await. So let's see how we do that in exercise 3. There's another way in which we can deal with futures indirectly, and that's using the await and async keyword. And to show you this, let's just imagine that instead of me getting a future value back here and then registering a callback, that I really don't want my code to look like JavaScript with callbacks, but instead I want it to look like if it's synchronous. So allow me to instead move this work into a function. So what I'll do is I'll create a function here call, let's call it do task. And so what does do task do? Well, do task is going to run our task. So I simply move this into a function. Of course, since I've moved that into function, I have to call do task from here. And I'll do the exact same thing with do task two. So let's cut this out and I'll create a do task two, which I'm going to write in a minute. So once again, I haven't changed anything. I've really, all I've done is really just move what we're doing into functions. So if we run this, we shouldn't expect any different from what we saw before. And so just to make sure that we didn't break anything and I'm not lying, um, let's just run it and see. So run it and we're enjoying our rewards and then we're going to do our task one and then we'll say that our task one is complete, then we'll do task two. 
So just as I promised, nothing is broken, still operates the same way. So why did I move it into functions? Like I said, instead I can use async. And so what that means is that since task one returns a future, I can say I want to wait on the value that it returns because it's a future, right? So I want to wait on when that future resolve. So I can say a wait. And when I use a wait, remember this is returning a future value. So I can say, let's say var, let's say call it on value, which is what we're gonna assume is being returned. We'll call it that. And I don't need to do a callback. Instead, I would simply just try and use that value like this. So there we go. Now, the reason I'm getting an error here is because if I use a wait, which says whatever you're doing, now there's a little bit more to it, which I'll explain later, but just trust me on this. Wherever you see a wait being called to wait on something, the function that's enclosing a wait must be an asynchronous function. So you have to use the async keyword after the function name. And so what this is basically said, it's signal to Dart runtime that, you know what, this function can be run asynchronously. Now, what, what we mean by asynchronously? Well, when we create those future, remember we say we're creating something that can run later. And so it can run asynchronous to main function or any other call in function. So in that case, we want to mark it as asynchronous function. And this function is calling a wait, which means that uh, it will get run later. So what's going to happen is Dart is going to come into this function, see the a wait, go into it doesn't wait here in dart 2 it actually calls task 2 task 1 sorry get a future and since we have a wait it knows that it has to wait on it and it's going to wait to resolve that future so let me change task 2 to be the same thing i have to say this is async the nice thing of this about this is that you can now call if you had another function that takes this value and it's also returned a future you can do a wait on that second function passing in this fourth value and so by doing it this way is the exact same thing as if this guy returns a future that then it get passed and returned by another task and da 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 so it, the same chain in thing is allowing you use a wait so here we change the name of our variable to s2 so let's do that but besides variable name change that's the only thing notice what my code look like if you ignore this async keyword it looks like what I'm doing is just calling a function task to getting a value back and then printing it out. Remember what I said, in the function where you use a wait, that function must be an asynchronous function. That's the only thing that you should sort of remember. Other than that, the function that it's going to call, well, it could return a future. Now, this still works if this function didn't return a future, by the way. It just works, runs right away. But because this runs a future, remember what's going to happen. It's going to get placed on the event queue. And that is what allowed this function to return back up to main. And then main does the same thing and call it task two, which eventually enqueues, you know, the task on the event queue. And then it returns and then it puts something on the micro task queue, um, queue. Then that returns and then we do our reward at the end of main, micro task queue. It's the same thing. Everything works as just as before. So enough talking, let me run this and see. So let's run and let's scroll up. And as you can see, we enjoy our reward. We get to the end of main, we did a micro task and notice how we still get into run and or task at the end, except now we then have to use then or anything like that. We simply wrote it using async keyword. So. In summary, the thing to take away from this is that you have two ways of writing asynchronous code in Dart. You can use the future API directly, like using something like this. Or if you have functions that are returning futures, you can just use a wait and async. Now, future have to do with return a value later. Streams have to do with something that could send any number of value whenever it wants, and then you just register and listen for it. So let's see how this sort of asynchronous way of programming when tied into streams, we can 
make it look synchronous. So let's create another example. Let's say that I want to generate some values. Now, before we had a stream of values we wanted to listen on, we converted that list of values to a stream. But now I actually want to have a function that generates some values. So one of the first things I'm going to do is import the math library. And so there. And so this will allow me to have access to a random number generator. So let's create a random number generator. And one of the things that you can pass to random is a seed. I like passing seed to random number generator as opposed to just using the default. So now we have a random number generator. Okay, so I am not so interested in putting things on the task queue. So that is, uh, let's take that out. I'm not really re worried about when we're able to get our rewards and all this other stuff. And let's just say that I start off with this. I have a function called int and it's going to generate numbers and maybe um, you can tell it how many numbers it should generate. And so ideally what we'll have is something like this. So something like this. Well, we know this is not going to work really. Um, what's gonna happen is the first value I get, I'm going to return that value and that's it, okay? Um, and of course I can, you know, this is gonna come in, i is gonna be equal to zero, it comes in here, returns zero and that's it. But I want it to keep returning values. So we know that though we can make this a stream that returns value. So let's let's just see what can happen here. So one way of doing this is to say that oh, we have a stream, right? And this stream yields integers. Now we'll come back to how to implement the stream just now. But in our main, what we can do then is we can say var s is the stream that we're going to get back from get num. And let's say we put five there. And so now that I have a stream, I can do s that listen, which is exactly what we did before. And so since there's going to be there's going to be some data that we expect to come, we can do print, you know, got uh, sync both. I got that from the stream. Okay. All right. Seems pretty straightforward. Look like a you know callback that we would put on a future, right? Except this is not then, but rather a listen because things can happen for a while. So what we, we have here, we're getting some, this function has a return type of string in, but doesn't end, let's see, doesn't end with a return statement. So what we need to do is say, I want to yield a value. So each time we go around, this yield tells the stream that, okay, produce a value essentially. But we need to, just like when we use the, a wait keyword within a function how we had to put that function as async well we need to do something similar instead of using async we have to use async star right so when we have a function that we're going to use a wait that function needs to be asynchronous when we have a function that yields a value into a stream that function is async star that's the differentiation, right? So you use async with a wait, and you a use async star with yield. And notice our error went away. So let's run this and see if this works. And there you go. See, so got a value from our stream. So we're able to produce value to the stream. And this is different than what we had before. Before, all we could do was convert a list into a stream. Let's call this example four, and let's copy this and make an example five. What we want to do in example five is see if it's possible to consume from the stream in what look like synchronous code instead of this code with like callback. We've seen how to do this with future, right? future that then, and then we were able to change that to a wait. Here's a stream and I save it in S. So we can say a wait, but this is a stream. So values are always going to keep coming. So 
what we want is actually a weight four and then we want var call it um, d in there and then we do s for example and we get rid of that all right so what i said before if you use a weight that function that you call it from must be async so like that okay um and so now you can see our error went away but notice all this look very similar except it's a for loop now before we were a waiting for one value and then using now we a wait for multiple values in the stream and then we can consume those values and so let's see if we get the same result that we got before when we were using stream that listen and we should expect that it's going to be the same because that's what i want to go through all this trouble to show it to you and there you go exact same thing so you have a choice now how you consume from streams whether you want to do stream that listen or you want to do something like this now one of the things that i did not cover is how do you handle exception from futures or stream and just like how we can do futures that then we can do future that on error we can do the same thing with streams and even when we do it with the synchronous looking calls a wait they also handle exception in that case you're going to be doing a try and catch if this doesn't make any sense to you don't worry too much i'm trying to just do the essence of what we need to cover in order to implement the block pattern and the whole error handling is not quite necessary for what we want to do but just know that's there now i promise you that i will show you what's in this readme file and so in learning uh, about the asynchronous programming in Dart. I went through a few material and I was frankly a little bit disappointed with some of them. And so I figured that I will I'll show you what really worked for me. And um, so that's it. So I would suggest that you go to this documentation, which talks about the future class. At least if you start from there, you can see what the future class at least offer you. And it's going to tell you a little bit about the error handling. From there, I think that oh, this next link is a great resource. It explained event loop. So let me show you what that is about. This is the future class documentation. As I mentioned, it shows you how to, um, if you have a future from a function, how you can listen to register a callback for a value. Um, you, or you can, you know, say if there's an error on that, you know, when, before the future was re resolved, how to handle it. So it shows you all that sort of stuff. Um, the next one I was showing you is this event look and dart. And this is the one where I went through and show you how there's the event queue and you can, and events are being pulled off of this queue in a loop and things can be in queued. And um, if you notice, this diagram is the diagram that I went over, which is when your application starts, it execute main, and then it go check the micro task queue. This is exactly where I get the diagram from. from. It really helped me understand it. And so, but I wanted to draw you a different diagram and walk you through it. That's why I did the animation there. So all that information came from here. So definitely check this out. If you go through this, there's a test basically where it asks you a question to determine if you really understand how um, event queue and the micro task queue work. And so if you go, through, if you read this, try and answer that question so you can know if you really get it. The second one is the toughest do not move on until you can understand the second one if what your answer doesn't match up for the second one read the explanation go back and read it and make sure you understand it. it's really going to help you the next thing that i think that really helped with just understanding future and async um, keyword and a weight is this um little article from coding with joe um, again very simple and by now if you read them in the order in which i presented um, the links, when you read this, you're going to be, oh, I totally get it. Um, this just makes sense. But it's still a very nice, simple article. And so it's not very long. So I, again, highly recommend that you read this also. Um, and the next one are these, um, this phase one and phase two with Dart language asynchronous support. And this also sort of breaks it down and show you a nice slow buildup of um, how to use async and await and in part two it explained the reason for async star um, sync star which we um, 
we showed for our generator and why you need to use them and so on. So definitely um, check this out. The last two, you should read them at some point. It's just in terms of getting the gist of things. Start here and then when you're on a plane or a boat or something, probably read those. Um, all right. These are the key takeaway about futures that I lifted verbatim from one of these articles, I think is the, ev the event loop one or the one on classes. So I put them here, but you're going to run into this when you do read it. So I'm not going to go through it. All right. So that's it. Hopefully you come away learning something and see you in the next video. Take care. Bye.